The first module discussed attitudes and treatment of people with disabilities throughout American history. The second module explained the philosophy and growth of the IL movement. The third module explained the legal foundations of civil rights and government programs that exist for people with disabilities in the United States. In this fourth module, you will learn about a framework or set of concepts that will help you determine whether the work you are engaged in is headed in the right direction, consistent with IL philosophy. This set of concepts is called the Disability Policy Framework. The independent living philosophy and movement began in the 1960s and has evolved over the last four decades. The values of consumer control, a focus on fixing the environment, and a goal of independent living are all part of this framework of disability policy. These basic core values are contained in independent living philosophy. Remember the chart in Module 2? These same values are now reflected in national legislation and policy, including the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and the Workforce Investment Act. Bobby Silverstein, one of the key federal disability legislation architects, has articulated this framework into a guide for advocates and policymakers. The disability policy framework has two core beliefs. The first one is, disability is a natural part of the human experience. These words appear in the Americans with Disabilities Act. It is a revolutionary change of thinking from the old belief that people with disabilities were defective. The second core belief is, the focus of policy should be to fix the environment, not the person. Barriers can be physical, attitudinal, or programmatic. All of these can keep people with disabilities from being more independent. Judy Human articulates this philosophy. Uh, what we've continued to say is that it's not our having disabilities that's li that limits our ability to be productive individuals. It's policies and practices that really prevent us from being able to be successful. Silverstein's disability policy has four goals. The first goal is equality of opportunity. This goal has three main components. The first part is individualization. This means that services should be tailored to meet the unique needs and abilities of the person. The second part is inclusion and integration. And the third part is effective and meaningful opportunity to participate. This means providing reasonable accommodations to make it possible for a person to access a program or benefit. The second goal of disability policy is full participation. This means that individuals with disabilities have the right to control the decisions about their own lives. It also means having a say at a broader level in decisions about programs and policies. Centers for Independent Living Requirements for 51% board and staff representation of persons with disabilities are an example of a policy that promotes full participation. The third goal of disability policy is independent living. Individuals with disabilities should be able to live how, where, and with whom they choose. They should also have maximum personal control over the services they receive. Essentially, this goal means being able to live and work like anyone else. And in the end, that's really what the movement is really about, allowing ourselves to be seen as 
individual people who um, are capable of making decisions and capable of making contributions. The fourth goal is economic self-sufficiency, which means a person has the financial means for their own support. Individuals with disabilities need competitive employment opportunities and access to programs of cash assistance and work incentives. With the Disability Policy Framework as a guide, we will examine three specific current challenges that face Centers for Independent Living in the 21st century. The challenges we will be reviewing in this module are ensuring that our work is cross-disability, building community living supports, and supporting competitive employment for people with disabilities. These are not intended to be the only challenges where Centers for Independent Living may choose to focus, but working on these areas can have a significant impact. There is an increasing sense of a disability community in this country. A 2004 Harris Survey of Americans with Disabilities indicates that a growing number of people with disabilities feel a sense of common identity. This number has increased substantially even since the last Harris Survey in 2000. This growing sense of common identity has implications for the IL movement. If people with different disabilities feel a shared identity, they are more likely to be receptive to supporting each other in mutual causes. A challenge for the movement is to broaden the circle of all people with disabilities under the big tent of IL. This includes people of differing race, ethnic origin, age, and diverse disabling conditions. All people with disabilities are part of the independent living family, including people with psychiatric, cognitive and developmental disabilities, HIV AIDS, multiple chemical sensitivities, and other new conditions that arise. So what are some of the reasons that people with disabilities have shied away from working together on common interests? We have seen that throughout history, individuals with disabilities have been devalued by society. Devalued people may not desire to associate with others who are perceived as devalued. Another reason may be that organizations view each other as competing for the same resources, both from government and private sources. Groups may feel that if others get more, our group will receive less. Another controversy that has at times split advocates into different camps is the issue of separate or special services versus integrated or mainstream services. Many groups have stated that separate services are necessary for their specific conditions. In contrast, IL philosophy condemns the discrimination and inferior treatment that segregation has brought to people with disabilities. Examples of cross-disability needs are housing, transportation, education, long-term care, and civil rights. Some specialized group needs are orientation and mobility training, Braille, and American Sign Language. These specialized types of needs do not have to be addressed in segregated settings. Coalitions are desirable across disability, age, race, and culture. Groups that participate in coalitions do not have to agree on every issue. But for issues on which they can agree, working together in a coalition can be an effective strategy for change. The more Centers for Independent Living reach out to underserved individuals, the more they will reap the benefits of diverse opinions and increased numbers. This challenge of expanding the disability community to include people with all kinds of disabilities was presented by Jonathan Young, who was a White House advisor on disability policy to President Bill Clinton. Jonathan Young said the following to Lex Frieden in an interview. I also want to challenge the disability community to look for ways to draw linkages with other aspects of major domestic policy and unite with other uh, uh, groups that have similar interests. Uh, you know, uh, Al Gore, when he accepted the task force report that I know you worked on, uh, said uh, something to the effect of, uh, it's not just the size of the feast, but how many people we can fit around the table. And I think that's a real opportunity to think about collaborative efforts uh, for us to join hands in, uh, uh, in, in taking part in uh, the diversity of American society. This fight for independence, freedom, and choice is for all people with disabilities, regardless of type of disability, age, color of skin, or country of origin. 
Another challenge for Centers for Independent Living is to build community living supports that make it possible for people with significant needs to move out of nursing homes or other institutions to live in the community. A similar challenge exists in supporting people of different ages who have never lived in institutions to remain in the community. A 1999 U.S. Supreme Court decision has given a boost to efforts to build community supports for people with disabilities. The court ruled in the Olmstead v. L.C. and E.W. decision that unnecessary segregation in an institution was unlawful discrimination. Two Georgia women with disabilities, Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson, won their fight to move out of an institution into the community and set a precedent for the rest of the country. As a result, every state in the U.S. is required to address the problem of unnecessary institutionalization and to build community supports for people to live in the community. Centers for Independent Living must approach this challenge at both an individual and system level. On an individual level, the strategy is one person at a time, because each person's situation is unique. Building community supports involves a complex process of coordinating housing, health care, cash benefits, transportation, and personal assistance for each person. Centers for Independent Living are uniquely able to help individuals through peer support networks. On a system level, the strategy is to build supports through policy advocacy. People with disabilities must be at the policy table and have input into the changes. One of the reasons that financial support for institutions remains strong is because of the institutional bias in Medicaid. When Medicaid began in 1964, nursing homes were a mandatory benefit for eligible individuals who needed nursing care. If the individual wanted to receive similar services in their home, Medicaid would not allow it. Home and community-based services waivers were started in the 1980s to allow individuals to receive nursing home level of care in their homes and community. Waiver programs have grown and are very popular in many states. However, the nursing homes are still the primary first-line program for people with significant disabilities. Medicaid requires the state to provide a nursing home bed for a person who qualifies, but is not required to provide services in the person's own home. This is the reason that many states have long and growing waiting lists for home and community services, but no waiting lists for nursing homes. What can Centers for Independent Living do about the institutional bias? As long as the nursing home is the default position and waivers are the exception, institutions will have the favored funding. Centers for Independent Living have a very important role in helping people move out of institutions and building adequate community support so they can remain in the community. Justin Dart again reminds us of the important role of system advocacy in changing policies that discriminate and that don't support freedom, choice, and independence. I've read enough history books to know that you don't take anything for granted. Uh, what will happen is what we make happen. People with disabilities want to take their rightful place in society and be contributing members. For many people with disabilities, that means working for pay. Having a job can be important for someone's self-esteem, but the income may also mean the difference between living in poverty and having a more comfortable living standard. No one wants to live in poverty. Working for pay does not have to mean working 40 hours a week. A job may be part-time with flexible hours and necessary accommodations. There are many reasons that people with disabilities do not work that have little to do with the limitations imposed by the disability. Discrimination is still a big barrier, despite the doors that the ADA has opened. People's disabilities may permit them to work sometimes, but not at other times. Jobs may not be available. Transportation is often an issue, especially in rural areas. Job accommodations and personal assistance may be difficult to obtain. Accessible housing may pose another barrier. Many people with disabilities want to work, but are afraid that working will affect their benefits. Centers for Independent Living can provide information and referral for educational opportunities, job training, transportation and employment assistance programs available for people with disabilities, such as vocational rehabilitation or supported employment. 
one-stop employment centers have resources for all job seekers and must provide equal access to individuals with disabilities. Cash benefit programs from Social Security are important to enable people with disabilities to live on their own. Having health care benefits, such as Medicaid and Medicare, sometimes means the difference between living and dying, or between poor health and a decent quality of life. People don't want to risk losing these benefits if working jeopardizes them. Centers for Independent Living should think about how their services, peer counseling, independent living training, and self-advocacy, can be focused to support people with disabilities to work. Centers for Independent Living are challenged to support people with disabilities to become part of the workforce to the extent each person is able. Work is possible and desirable for many people with disabilities. Advocacy efforts within each state and at the national level are needed to improve the services and supports necessary to eliminate work barriers. The challenges for the independent living movement may seem daunting and overwhelming to you. You may ask yourself, what can I do to eliminate some of these barriers so that people with disabilities are more empowered, more independent, and live with more freedom and dignity? Many of the barriers in our society have existed for so long that it is difficult to imagine how to change deep-seated attitudes and behaviors toward people with disabilities. But remember the progress that has been made in just the past four decades. It is possible for a few empowered individuals to change the world, as Margaret Mead said, a small group of thoughtful people could change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. The short history of the IL movement is full of examples. You too can become one of those empowered individuals by taking one step at a time, one day at a time, one person at a time. In thinking about the disability policy framework and the three challenge areas, what activities is your Center for Independent Living already involved in at the local, state, and national level? If you are a new staff member or are not familiar with all of your center's activities, find the answers. As a reminder, the three challenge areas are 1. Ensuring the work of SILS is cross-disability and culturally, ethnically, and linguistically diverse. 2. Building community living supports. 3. Supporting employment for people with disabilities. What is one step that you can take to advance this work further? Remember, you don't have to do it alone. Justin Dart believed that leadership and advocacy were the keys. We got to get out. And I think we got the greatest movement that ever was. I, I'm proud of the quality of our leadership. There just aren't enough of us yet. We, we need to put a couple of zeros behind the numbers of our leaders. We don't Justin Dart inspired a generation of advocates for people with disabilities. SILs need more people to get out, speak up, and take action. Your participation is critical, as Judy Human states. I believe that the way we improve our lives, whether it's in technology or education or employment, whatever it may be, is that it's very important for the affected people to be our own spokespersons. Justin Dart was famous for his rhetoric of empowerment. Let his words resonate today. Empower yourself, empower the world. Get into the politics of empowerment as if your life depended on it, because they do in the lives of your children and your grandchildren. Produced by Independent Living Research Utilization of the Institute for Rehabilitation and Research. Richard Petty, Executive Producer. Daryl Jones, Associate Executive Producer. Developed by the Center for Persons with Disabilities, Utah State University. Judith Holt, Producer. Marilyn Hammond, Director. Writers, Kathy Chambliss, Donna Gleaves, Helen Roth. Additional production staff, Jeannie Peck. Narrator, Wendy Hassan. Music, Diane Coleman. Photographs, video, and drawings, courtesy of ILRU, Center for Persons with Disabilities, Chicago Historical Society, Dread One Min Productions, Gallaudet University, Library of Congress, Prints and Photographs Division, Options for Independence, Not Dead Yet, Realistic Reflections, Yoshiko Dart, Resna. Editing, Captioning, and DVD Production, Kesar Video and DVD Productions. 
For more information, access our website at www.ilru.org. The ILRU, Independent Living Research Utilization Program, is a national center for information, training, research, and technical assistance in independent living. Copyright 2006.